Hi, um, this lecture is about oxidative stress and its effect upon causing cognitive impairment, brain damage, neurodegeneration. And you're going to hear a lot about oxidative stress. Some people say it's the most common cause of aging and other things like that. And there's a lot of details to it, but it's going to end up coming down to a very simple concept. Um, the goal of this lecture will be to explain this slide. Right now, I'll just show it to you, but after we've gone through the you know the backstory and the context it'll all make sense so superoxide is normally cleared by superoxide dismutase and catalase or um, glutathione peroxidase so here is the electron transport chain in the mitochondria the inner mitochondrial membrane electrons are transferred down these protein complexes but in certain contexts there will be leakage of electrons or reversal of electron transport whereby a single electron will come down to the oxygen, and that is superoxide. The little dot right here uh, means that it's a free radical having an unpaired electron in its outer orbital. And this superoxide is a free radical that can potentially be neutralized very easily by superoxide dismutase, SOD, into hydrogen peroxide, H2O2, and that's further neutralized by the enzymes catalase or glutathione peroxidase into H2O. That's what normally happens. That's what you want to happen, have happen. But sometimes the superoxide can undergo a series of reactions and become a hydroxyl radical. There's actually several ways that can happen. And the hydroxyl radical can destroy the inner mitochondrial membrane through a process called lipid peroxidation. It can also destroy proteins and DNA. And so the real question is, why does this happen and what can we do to avoid it? And you're going to find out that there's a lot you can do, um, and we'll take a look at that. So what is oxidative stress? ROS means reactive oxygen species and free radicals. So first of all, an oxidant is something that takes an electron. It steals an electron from other chemicals. It's an electron thief. Um, now, reduction is when something gains an electron. It's easy to remember because you're going to reduce the valence number, the charge number assigned to that element once it's reduced. An antioxidant is the opposite of an oxidant. It's a, an electron giver, an electron donor. And typically an antioxidant is able to give an electron but remain stable itself because it'll have a lot of double bonds which delocalize the charge so it can handle that change in charge. Uh, normally, the body will have a balance of AOs for antioxidants and oxidants. And that's why you want to eat a lot of fruits and vegetables, because you get the antioxidants. We talked about that. Plants have to survive out in the sun, and they make all these chemicals to protect themselves from the intense sun, whereas an animal doesn't, because it just it doesn't have them when you eat animal meat, for example, because the animal goes into the shade. So plants are where you get your antioxidants. Um, if you have an imbalance where there's a lot more reactive oxygen species, RNS is reactive nitrogen species relative to your antioxidants, then you'll have oxidative stress where you get these cascades of damaging reactions. A free radical is a molecule that has an unpaired electron in its outer orbital. They tend to be highly reactive electron stealers. They steal electrons and they don't give them back. And that's a reasonable way to think of a lot of uh, pathogens. Um, they can cause chain reactions where one molecule, one molecule steals an electron from another molecule, it then reacts with the molecule next to it, and you have this cascade, like a series of dominoes, damaging your plasma membranes and your mitochondrial membranes. Uh, the free radicals are going to come from oxygen or nitrogen are going to contribute to them. So here's superoxide. So you have an oxygen, which would just be O2, but there's an extra electron here, and you see the dot for the electron, and it'll have a negative charge. So that's the symbol of a free radical, a superscripted dot. Um, uh, superoxide has a short half-life, 10 to the negative fifth second. Hydrogen peroxide is called a reactive oxygen species because it is quite reactive, but it is not a free radical. Um, that's why you call them reactive oxygen species. It has a much longer half-life on the order of minutes. And because of that, hydrogen peroxide can travel out of mitochondria. It can travel from wherever it is to other spots. It can also traverse uh, membranes. So that makes it able to carry uh, potential hyperreactive problems to other locations. It can exit the mitochondria. Um, hydroxyl radicals are the really aggressive, fast-reacting free radicals. They're typically drawn as like an OH with a dot like this. You can draw it the other way with a dot on the other side. They react very quickly within 10 to the 9th seconds. There's other types of free radicals. 
Uh, lipid peroxyl radicals, they can last for seven seconds. Now, R and S are the reactive nitrogen species. Nitric oxide is the most common one you're going to hear about. NO, and there's the dot. Um, for making it a free radical, and that has a half-life on the order of one second, so that also can travel a bit. It's not clear if it's made in the mitochondria or if it just diffuses into the mitochondria, but it's definitely in the mitochondria and it causes problems in the mitochondria. It'll react with superoxide um, anion free radical here to form peroxynitrite, and that can then have subsequent damaging reactions. It can then react, it'll often get protonated physiologic pH, and that'll produce another hydroxyl radical. So we saw that all in the picture, and I realize some of this is going to sound complicated if you haven't heard it before, but just trust me, if you, if you follow this, you know, you'll understand oxidative stress and free radicals, and you realize, you know, it's another primarily paper tiger once you understand it. Okay, sources of reactive oxygen species and reactive nitrogen species. Mitochondrial electron transport chain is by far the most common source of these things. Even though it's very few oxygens end up as superoxides, it's just because there's always a lot going on with that electron transport chain. Um, this little symbol here is for the inner mitochondrial membrane proton gradient. So change like a gradient and just know that that means mitochondrial uh, membrane. If you see a P right here, that'll be for plasma membrane. Sometimes we've talked about that in the past with regard to a sodium gradient. Whereas in the inner mitochondrial membrane, we're talking about a proton gradient. And just like in the plasma membrane, the sodium gradient drives active transport of other ions. In the inner mitochondrial membrane, the proton gradient is used to, it's harvested, if you will, to do all kinds of work for the mitochondria. Um, and the big thing to know is excessive dietary fat increases the mitochondrial membrane, inner mitochondrial membrane gradient, because it causes more rapid pumping of the protons and that gradient gets too high. Once it gets too high on the inner mitochondrial membrane, it'll start to go backwards. So that's a real important point. This is important and worth knowing. Excessive dietary fat, especially saturated fat, but excessive dietary fat in general, you have a tendency towards elevated inner mitochondrial membrane gradient with subsequent reversal of electron transport, and that leading to increased reactive oxygen species and tissue damage. Um, it especially occurs in inner uh, membrane complexes one and three of the electron transport chain. You can get superoxide anions at other locations. Even some of the Krebs cycle enzymes, the ones that have flavoproteins with dehydrogenase in their name, like alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase, they can make them as well, but it's the electron transport chain. And that's really all that matters for our purposes in this talk, electron transport chain. If you get that, everything will be good with this concept. Um, and we talked about the Michael Brownlee paper on diabetes. If you're interested in diabetes, I've got a bunch of other lectures on that, and the Brownlee paper is the best one. Um, but this is also why high-fat diets associated with all the major problems associated with diabetes. It's associated with coronary artery disease. It's associated with atherosclerosis, cognitive impairment, Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, vascular dementia. That's why people say, oh, you're good fats. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, outer mitochondrial membrane has an enzyme monoamine oxidase, and you'll sometimes hear talk about these things as other potential sources of reactive oxygens. Yeah, fine, but the mitochondrial membrane, that's the money. That's the thing to pay attention to. Um, plasma membrane's got any DPH oxidase, yeah, fine. We know that you can get diabetes-related AGEs, advanced glycation end products. Yeah, fine, I have a picture of that and I'll talk about that elsewhere. There's also reactive oxygens produced by our macrophages when they're trying to kill bacteria. It's called the respiratory burst. Uh, free iron, when it's excessive, is very dangerous. It can undergo redox cycling between the two charged forms of Fe2 plus and Fe3 plus and in the presence of oxygen, generate a lot of free radicals. That's autocatalytic. Tobacco smoking is bad. Beta amyloid peptide. We'll talk about that some other time. Um, okay, so some of the ways that the ROS and the RNS cause damage. Um, if it's really severe and acute, you know, you can get necrosis where a cell dies and it lyses its plasma membrane and there's a big... Uh, release of its contents in the adjacent area, and it creates an inflammatory response by the immune system, the macrophages, for example, or the microglia in the brain. Whereas chronic gradual processes undergo programmed cell death, that's called apoptosis, so you don't see a lot of findings on an MRI, for example. So ROS, RNS damage to lipids, they'll cause lipid peroxidation, that's like the domino chain reaction. 
where you destroy all these phospholipids. And it's especially hydroxyl radical that does that. I put hydroxyl radical in this intense red just to identify it as a key destructive uh, component of uh, lipid peroxidation and free radicals. Cardiolipin is a PUFA, polyunsaturated fatty acid in the intermitochondrial membrane, very common in that location. Arachidonic acid is a common PUFA in plasma membranes. In the brain, you got lots of PUFAs. And real commonly, we talk about EPA and DHA. Those are your classic omega-3 um, essential, not essential fats. Those are classic omega-3 fat PUFAs in your brain cells, in your brain neurons. Um, and lipid peroxidation, like I said, it can destroy the mitochondrial membrane. It can destroy plasma membranes. It's a big deal. Okay, they can also damage proteins. The peroxynitrites in particular tend to react with tyrosine, re tyrosine residues, the amino acid side chain, and they will cause uh, protein nitration and make your proteins misfold and be dysfunctional. Um, the lipid peroxide byproducts like toxic aldehydes like HNE, we talked about that in my other previous lectures about omega-6 cooking oils. Hydroxynonanol will do similar damaging things to amino acid side chains. Once the protein starts binding these other things, it misfolds and it's no longer functional. Uh, they can bind to DNA and cause DNA adducts that lead to single strand or double strand breakage of DNA. You can measure uh, eight Oxo-2-deoxyguanine is a marker of oxidative stress from DNA damage. Okay, antioxidant enzymes, uh, in particular superoxide and catalase. The point is that we've got antioxidants in the form of enzymes, and we've also got antioxidants in the form of electron scavengers. So superoxide just mutates. SOD is the most important one you're going to hear about. The manganese form is in the mitochondrial matrix. The copper zinc form is in the intramembranous space of mitochondria. And again, those will take the superoxides and convert them into H2O2, hydrogen peroxide. So they're neutralizing the danger of the superoxide partially. And then catalase fully takes you to something completely benign, into water. So it'll take the hydrogen peroxide and the catalase enzyme will convert it into water and oxygen. That's what you want. Glutathione peroxidase is something very similar, converting the hydrogen peroxide into water. Um, it can also reduce the <clears throat> hydroxyl radical into water, so it's very useful to the cell. That's why you want to have adequate antioxidants, because they help keep these free radical problems under control. Um, there's also a peroxyredoxin, which can convert peroxynitrate just into HNL2. They can basically uh, make that a lot safer as well. And now here's where the problems start. We're going to talk about something called the Fenton reaction. And the way to remember the Fenton reaction is Fenton starts with the letters Fe, and Fe is a symbol for iron. So when iron is in the presence of hydrogen peroxide, it can change its valence from Fe2 plus to Fe3 plus. So it's donating an electron to the hydrogen peroxide, and that can lead to the formation of a hydroxyl radical. This is similar. This is just called a hydroxide ion. But here's the hydroxyl radical, and that's the one that can interact with the lipid uh, membranes very quickly and cause lipid peroxidation. Haber-Weiss reaction can also react with H2O2 and lead to the formation of a hydroxyl radical. Um, for our purposes, though, remember Fe and Fenton. That's useful. Um, this will come up in a special context when I give a separate lecture on iron someday in the future. Hydroxyl radical likes to steal electrons from PUFAs, polyunsaturated fatty acids. And we're going to show pictures here in just a second. I'm kind of going through the text so you've heard it once, so when you see the picture, it'll click for you. Okay, hydroxyl radical forming the mitochondria will cause destruction of the intermitochondrial membrane and lipid, the cardiolipin, special type of phospholipid with four tails on it in the intermitochondrial membranes, especially prone to lipid peroxidation. Um, another thing is that complex one, it can push... Uh, superoxides into the intramembranous space. So that's important too. They're not just localized to the mitochondria. They're in other locations and they cause a lot of problems. These are just electron uh, scavengers. Some of your vitamins, you know, vitamin A, vitamin, uh, you know, your B-carotene. Your vitamin C is key water-soluble uh, antioxidant. Vitamin E is your key lipid-soluble antioxidant. So those also help to keep free radicals under control. Okay, mechanism of cell death. I'm not going to talk too much about this. This is really a topic for a future lecture, but I'm just going to share with you a couple things why I am so 
meticulous about recommending to old people to reduce their fat intake. When I say old people, I mean middle-aged and old people because your brain's more fragile than you think. All right, I'll show you some of the types of books like I like to read. Here's a book I'm reading called Neurodegeneration, and it's a decent little textbook. Um, and one of the things I want to show you in here is just one picture. Here's arteries. I know you can't quite see it, but you're going to get the point. You can't see the picture, but you'll get the idea on it, is that these arteries in your brain in an old person, after having uh, diabetes or high-fat diet for years, um, and hypertension especially, you're going to get sclerosis of the arterial walls or hypertrophy of them. They're going to become thickened around your capillaries, your basement membranes, and that will decrease gas exchange. Because in order to keep a neuron alive, you've got to have adequate oxygen and glucose delivery. So there's strike number one. Thickened basement membrane along your gas exchange, capillaries, and arterioles. Okay, so that's compromising your ability to get oxygen and glucose to your brain cells. The second thing is, if you eat a high-fat diet, that will cause sludging of your red blood cells and rouleau formation, and that's also going to drop your oxygen delivery, let's say another 15 to 20 percent. So now you got two things interfering with that. Then the third thing is all that fat floating around in your blood causes insulin resistance. And people say, oh, well, the brain doesn't care. No, the brain does care. The brain does have glucose type 4 transporters, which are insulin sensitive in your hippocampus and your hypothalamus. So they are going to have a hard time getting glucose into the cell. So you're triple screwing your neurons, all right? Chronic problems, the high fat diet, and then the insulin resistance. And it's going to get worse than that. We talked about that in other lectures about ramping up the metabolic demand, exposing oneself unwittingly to a different additional metabolic toxin so your ATP production goes down. So, I mean, it's not a mystery why so many people are cognitively impaired. It's sad, you know. Like I said, an Okinawan's expecting to have a sharp brain mentally intact when they're 85, whereas Americans think they should be having senior moments in their 50s, you know. It's good to have high aspirations. If you at least aim for a high aspiration, you'll do a lot better than just expecting to be all fat and sick in your 50s. Okay, the brain does not like to burn fat. I'm going to talk about this more in a future lecture, but this is really interesting and it's important for health. Another reminder of why you want to minimize your dietary fat intake. So first of all, high-fat diet reduces oxygen delivery to the brain. Secondly, it takes about 15% more oxygen to run the reactions to burn fat by beta oxidation, which means a typical fatty acid burning pathway in the mitochondrial matrix. So that's another reason why the brain does not want to burn fat. Burning fat, as we talked about with the lectures on diabetes, causes more generation of reactive oxygen species because it causes reversal of electron transport. Okay, um, and there's tons of PUFAs in the inner mitochondrial membrane. It's bad. Uh, brain cells have surprisingly weak antioxidant defense systems, about 50 times less catalase enzyme, for example, than a liver cell. And non-esterified fatty acids, they're called NEFAs, <clears throat> they can behave like protonophores, where they'll, they'll actually cause an opening in the inner mitochondrial membrane that lets some of the protons leak back into the matrix. And in, <clears throat> even though that lowers your ability to produce ATP. On the one hand, that might protect the inner mitochondrial membrane from increased reactive oxygen production. Less superoxides will be produced because you got a leak in the gradient, so the gradient doesn't go so high. <clears throat> Energy is made from fat two times slower than it's made from glucose. So the brain is kind of like a fast twitch muscle fiber. It has to do things a lot of fast. You're talking, you got to think, you got to move, you got to run, you got to do all kinds of things. So the brain wants glucose. Glucose burns fast, provides energy real fast. That's what the brain wants. It doesn't want this slow fat stuff. Slow and steady is not what the brain wants. So that's another reason why the brain does not want to burn glucose. Um, and I think in the brain also, in the neurons, when I'm talking about astrocytes, those are supporting cells of the brain. The brain, think of it as having two main cells. One are neurons, those do your thinking, those transmit all the action potentials. Then number two is the astrocytes. Astrocytes are like mama, okay? They take care of the neuron. They give it food, they clean up its mess, they store some glycogen to give it more food when it needs it, they help it with producing its neurotransmitters. Uh, they don't need to run as fast as the neurons do. Um, excessive uh, fat, like saturated fat, will increase blood-brain barrier permeability, which allows more uh, potential excitotoxins into the brain area like MSG, MFG, aspartame. Okay, so that was an introduction to why the brain does not run on fat. That's an important point. Okay.
Just a quick introduction here to metabolism. Glucose is taken into a cell. It's phosphorylated by this enzyme HK for hexokinase, glucose 6-phosphate. Undergoes glycolysis, becomes pyruvate. Then it goes into the mitochondria, runs through Krebs cycle. Then it goes to electron transport chain and oxidative phosphorylation. And so that's how it gets to the mitochondria. And then here's a normal mitochondria. This is a series of electron transport complexes. Complex 1, complex 2, coenzyme Q, intramembranous carrier, complex 3, cytochrome C, complex 4. At complexes 1, 3, and 4, protons are pumped into the intramembranous space between the inner mitochondrial membrane and the outer mitochondrial membrane. So this intramembranous space builds up an accumulation of protons, and then those are harvested by the ATP synthase coming back in to generate the energy to stick a phosphate onto ADP to make ATP the energy currency of a cell. And that's normal electron transport, this transport of electrons, and oxidative phosphorylation, oxygen-related phosphorylation of ADP. And that's how we make the vast majority of our energy in the human body, especially in the brain. And that's how it normally should run. Each progressive uh, electron carrier, subsequent one, has stronger desire to grab those electrons. Oxygen has the strongest, and that's why it's the ultimate electron acceptor. And that's how normal electron transport works. Uh, just a brief discussion of fatty acids because we're going to have to know a little bit about them. Fatty acid is uh, sort of bipolar, if you will. It has a polar end that's charged, hydrophilic. That's a carboxylic acid. There's a, you know, like a ketone, if you will, or a carbonyl group is better to call it on this carbon than a hydroxyl group. And then the rest is just carbons and hydrogens that's nonpolar, hydrophobic. And that's why these are amphiphilic, like an amphibian can live on land and water. The polar charged end, because it's typically deprotonated at a physiologic pH, that will interact with aqueous solution, with water, whereas the uncharged tail of this thing with all the carbons and hydrogen, hydrogen and carbon don't have a charge because they got about the same electronegativity, same desire to grab electrons, that will sit in the hydrophobic uh, locations like the inner part of the lipid bilayer. Okay. So this is called the carboxyl end, and this is called the methyl end of the fatty acid. This is the most common fatty acid, saturated fat in the human body. It's called palmitic acid. Often when it's deprotonated, it's just called palmitate. And you'll hear that all the time if you study anything about lipids. All right, now here's where it's going to start getting more interesting. Here's a PUFA, polyunsaturated fatty acid. So, so here's sat fat, no double bonds. Here's a MUFA, monounsaturated fat, meaning one double bond. And here's a PUFA polyunsaturated fatty acids. So it's got more than one double bond. So here's a double bond, here's another double bond, and then the carbon in between is called the methylene bridge because the CH2 is a methylene group, and this hydrogen is especially vulnerable to being plucked off because these two double bonds, they're pulling on the electrons uh, related to that hydrogen there, so it's, it doesn't have a tight grip on that hydrogen and it easily gets pulled off, and that's the key site where lipid peroxidation happens. And now here is cardiolipin. You can see, look at cardiolipin with all its double bonds. It's in a unique phospholipid in that it has four fatty acid tails. So it really doesn't get any worse than that for being susceptible to lipid peroxidation. Four fatty acid tails with these uh, PUFA fatty acid tails. All right. And so that'll get peroxidized and you'll, you'll trash your membrane and it can cause cell death if you trash, you know, multiple mitochondrial membranes. So here's just a diagram of lipid peroxidation, the uh, chain reaction. So here's the methylene bridge hydrogen that gets plucked off. Then you've got this free radical electron sitting unpaired. Oxygen in its presence will form a peroxyl. Peroxyl just means two oxygens next to each other. And then this is now still a free radical, though, and it'll interact with the adjacent fatty acid and cause damage to it. And this will go on and on, trashing multiple uh, fatty acid tails within a plasma membrane. And it'll destroy the function of the membrane and uh, the cell will quite often die. Okay, this is just a list of some inhibitors of glycolysis, Krebs cycle, mitochondrial. Some, most of these you can avoid them. Some of them you can't completely avoid. And that's one other point I kind of made before is that you're going to have some inhibition of your metabolic energy production systems no matter what you do. The worst one for our purposes is fat because high dietary fat will back up this whole chain of events here, this electron transport, 
And then some of these other ones, like we talked about hydroxynanol from omega-6 cooking oil. So I've talked about all these things in other lectures. There's some lead, there's some cadmium, et cetera. There's some herbicides that can affect things too. And so you can't, you avoid everything as much as you can. You can't avoid everything, all the negative stuff, but you want to be as healthy as you can with the stuff you can control so your body's got more reserve to handle it. We talked about in my previous diabetes, muscle membrane, flip-flop maneuver, mechanism of uh, fatty acid entry into the skeletal muscle, how the fatty acids can cross the skeletal muscle just across the phospholipid bilayer. They don't have to go through a fatty acid transporter. And that's why they accumulate in skeletal muscle in a concentration gradient dependent fashion, meaning the more you eat, the more fat you eat, the more it gets into your skeletal muscle. And we talked about this a lot more in the diabetes lectures, how fat first accumulates in skeletal muscle and makes it insulin resistant, then it accumulates in the liver, makes it insulin resistant, and then it accumulates in the pancreas and destroys the pancreatic beta cells. And that's what diabetes is all about. And that's why you want to reduce your fat intake, optimize your body weight as soon as possible, and you can very often cure type 2 diabetes, whereas the longer it progresses, the more damage it does to the pancreas and becomes irreversible. Uh, this is just a brief uh, slide from our previous diabetes lecture. This is about advanced glycation end products and how they can cause some oxidative stress, but that's really a minor point in the context of this lecture. Okay. All right, so here's really sort of the important stuff, and this is the slide we were working our way back to. That So here's our normal electron transport chain running, but you eat a high-fat diet, you'll, you can back this thing up where this uh, gradient goes too high, your proton gradient, and electrons are released you know, backwards. Because the pressure is too high in the gradient, because the gradient is too high, complex 3 won't be able to pump protons against the high gradient of the inner mitochondrial membrane. And so its electron transport direction will reverse. And then the electron will get dropped onto oxygen here, and it will form superoxide. So that's an extra electron added to oxygen. Under ideal conditions, normal conditions, superoxide just mutates, will neutralize it, make it into hydrogen peroxide, and then catalase or glutathione peroxidase or thioredoxin, they will, look, they will convert it to H2O, and everything is good. No big deal. That happens all the time, all day long. However, if the superoxides become too excessive, they can react with nitric oxide and form uh, peroxynitrite, and then that can subsequently yield a hydroxyl radical, which will trash the inner mitochondrial membrane with lipid peroxidation. Excuse me. And in addition, sometimes if there's free iron sitting around, free iron is like fire. You know, just like you got fire in your house, it's good to have fire in the stove to cook food. It's good to have fire in the fireplace if you're cold to warm you up. Good to have fire in the furnace to, you know, heat your house. Okay. But you don't want fire anywhere else or it destroys things. That's kind of like what iron is inside the human body. It's very useful when it plays a role as part of hemoglobin for oxygen carrying. It's very useful as it plays a role within electron transporting protein complexes, okay? But it's not good when it's floating free around because it tends to undergo autocatalysis to make a lot of reactive oxygen. So anyways, iron can react in the Fenton reaction, Fe for Fenton reaction, with hydrogen peroxide and produce a hydroxyl radical. That can then go to the plasma membrane. I put CL here for cardiolipin. See how there's little four fatty acid tails compared to a regular phospholipid with two fatty acid tails? So it's very prone to that PUFA has a methylene bridge carbon to being uh, undergoing lipid peroxidation. And this can yield hydroxynanols, and you get this cascade of destructive reactions trashing plasma membranes. So anyways, what's the point of all this? Minimize your dietary fat intake, and you're much less likely to under, undergo these lipid peroxidation damaging reactions. There's a little more to it than that, but the same thing that's healthy for your heart and the rest of your brain also prevents oxidative stress. And this is why I don't think oxidative stress is the main point. The key thing you want to avoid is, is you know, the, the dietary toxins and the dietary excessive amounts of fat because there's tons of books. Like here, I'll show you a book I'm reading right now. Acute Neuronal Injury, okay? And this will tell you, you know, 30 different ways that neurons die once these cascades get going. But that really doesn't matter. It's like, it's like garbage time in a basketball game the last five minutes after you're ahead by 40 points. It doesn't matter. What matters is what initiates the process. And so the best protection against is the same old story. Low fat, low sodium, plant-based diet, 100% organic. Um, you know, get your exercise, get your sun, all that stuff too. But that protects you from this oxidative stress. When you hear about oxidative stress, just remember it's a secondary event. It's not the primary event. So hope that was helpful.